Thank you, Gary. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to talk to you about Bloomberg GPT. Um, so, um, Bloomberg GPT is a 50 billion parameter language model that we trained on 600 billion tokens, about half of which are in the financial domain. Um, in the talk, I want to touch on two areas. Um, there, there are many, many pieces of this which are interesting and complicated and unknown, but there are two things that uh, I hope that uh, I'm able to shed a little more light on. One is, um, what are the optimal choices for building a large language model? Um, and then second, what was the impact of domain-specific data on the ad model's performance? And both of these, I think, are interesting, not just for us, but for the broader community. Um, you know, it's not, it, it uh, has been clear by kind of proof that you can build these models, uh, but exactly how the sausage gets made, so to speak, uh, is complicated. So uh, this, is, this is the topics that I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about uh, presenting the idea of language modeling um, briefly. I'm gonna talk about uh, decoder-only transformer language models. I'm gonna talk about some of the choices that you have to make. I'm gonna go through an evaluation, and finally, uh, I'm gonna do some product reviews and a little bit of a discussion. So uh, to set some context, um, the language modeling problem um, is a very straightforward problem. Uh, the idea is you have some sequence of text, maybe it's characters, maybe it's tokens, maybe it's words, um, and you wanna produce a probability over the next word, token, character. Um, one of the nice properties of this model is that when you're training it, you don't need any supervised training data. You can actually just look at data in the wild and that natively gives you the training data that you need. Um, and so the process of training is you just collect a lot of data um, and then you fit your probability distribution on top of that data. Now the, um, the idea of language models uh, is, is a really very old idea. It dates back to Claude Shannon in the 1950s um, who proposed the idea of a language model for estimating the entropy of English. Um, and at the time when he proposed it, it was, uh, I, I wanna say a little bit of a thought, of ex a thought, of a thought experiment, um, a way to explain the idea of entropy, a way to the, explain um, you know, the ideas of information theory that he was working on. Um, and it really was, uh, it took kind of a while um, before it started to see some applications. Um, the first application area that language modeling started to have a huge impact was in speech recognition. So in the late 70s, Fred Jelinek um, introduced the idea of a, a, the noisy channel model uh, for doing speech recognition. In the noisy channel model, there are two sub-models. There's the acoustic model, which goes from uh, waveforms to phonemes, and then there's the language model that uh, produces a probability distribution over likely words. And you kind of mash these two together and you search for high likelihood sequences in this joint space. Um, and then you uh, do speech, and then you get a, a translation of waveform to words. Um, and this idea of the noisy channel model and the acoustic and the language model combined uh, powered speech recognition for many, many decades and is still, uh, still very important. Um, it was only kind of a while later um, that these ideas were taken up for machine translation. Um, it was uh, a group at IBM, later went to Rentec, um, that explored the idea of using language modeling in translation context. And for translation, um, the setup is actually very similar to a noisy channel model, except um, instead of a, a waveform to a phoneme, you imagine that, okay, if you're speaking English, that's really you know, a corrupted Spanish, and first you have to change the word ordering. Uh, there was like, there was a, so there was a word order model, and then you have to come up with a likely word sequence in Spanish, uh, and that's where a Spanish language model, as an example, would come through. And so machine translation was rephrased as, again, this, you know, two-part model, you know, this uh, word ordering model, and then this language model. Um, and so those ideas uh, in what was called the IBM model one, two, three of the 90s uh, went on to be the cornerstone of Google Translate in the 2000s uh, and were kind of powered a lot of the statistical machine translation. Um, but, uh, you know, during that time, even though NLP was kind of very connected to both of these um, research groups, to speech recognition group and machine translation, it really didn't have any impact on the way that you did NLP. And it was really only until um, 
GPT-3 that the idea of using language modeling uh, started to become uh, really a direct challenge to the entire way that, that uh, we did NLP or we do NLP. Um, so let me, let me give kind of a personal example. So in uh, the year 2000, um, many years ago, um, this was a problem that, uh, that me and my colleagues uh, were looking at, um, which was a reading comprehension problem. In reading comprehension, the setup is you have a short snippet of text, and at the end of the text, you have a few questions. And the goal is to answer the questions where you're guaranteed that the answer to the question is somewhere in the text. Um, and these were for third to fifth graders. So in 2000, the way that you built one of these models is you had multiple little, little models that extracted different pieces of information. And if you were really smart in 2000, you trained them statistically. And if you were incredibly smart, uh, you, you thought about how to propagate the probabilities through all these smaller models. Um, and even after you did all of that work, uh, you, you could publish some papers, which we did, but nothing really worked. Uh, it, the performance was low. Okay, so this is uh, in, in 2020 or 2021. GPT-3 came out and I took, uh, this was one of the reading comprehension problems that we looked at. Um, so I took that and I put it into GPT-3 um, and this is what it came out. It, it read the, the snippet of text and it said, oh, okay, we're asking questions about this text, great. I got some more questions for you. It asked a few, it asked a few more questions and then it gave answers to the questions. Um, and so this was, uh, I want to say, a little bit of a shock because uh, instead of doing all of these smaller models that you would have, you know, hand pieced together and connected, there was one model that was trained on a language model modeling criteria using unsupervised text uh, that was able to solve this problem. And so, um, you know, me and my colleagues all kind of looked at each other and were like, oh, well, okay, well, this is going to be a big deal for us. Um, because we do, at Bloomberg, we do a lot of NLP over a lot of different areas. Um, and so we looked at this and we're like, okay, we should probably think about how we're going to integrate this into our practice. Um, and I think what was so revolutionary of language models, I think why they're so important right now, is that they have three um, properties um, which, are, which are quite different than, you know, what NLP models and NLP modeling had done. Fit, you know, done before. One is that uh, it's very general. You have one model that can handle really, really a very wide degree of tasks. Maybe we would have built things separately for each of these tasks and got a good performance, um, but you wouldn't expect one model to do all of them. Second is that um, it's broad in terms of the amount of information that you have inside of a model. Later on in the talk, I'm going to present results on um, what's called the, the MMLU, or Massively Multitask Language Understanding set of evaluations. And you can see that the, the model knows, knows things uh, or can answer questions across very deep subject areas, biology, chemistry, as example. Um, but I think it's a third thing which is really um, the most impactful and revolutionary about LLMs, which is that th when you interact with them, you interact th with them through language. What you know people call nowadays prompt engineering, you're interacting with it through language, and as a response, you get language back. Um, and so the, the ability to build something and deploy it and not need a, a NLP engineer, a machine learning engineer, or a software engineer even, to allow end users to interact with the model is a big deal. This is the first, it's the first piece of technology that I've ever built uh, in my entire life that I could show my dad, uh, and he was like, oh, okay, this is useful for me now. Um, and so that was, I think, I think that's been a big deal, and I think that explains a lot of the impact of ChatGPT. Uh, it was such an obvious interface that you didn't have to be a programmer or an NLP expert or machine learning expert to know how to interact with it. Um, so to kind of give a, a little more context on where LLMs um, are generally effective, um, you know, there are a lot of operations on synthesis and understanding of text uh, where they really shine. So summarization, information extraction are great examples. Um, when it comes to, to document understanding, so not just picking a piece of data out of text or reforming it, but starting to ask questions which involve some kind of reasoning over the text, they also do quite well. Sentiment and analytics is one example. Insight extraction is another, you know, uh, let me read this 
earnings report? What are the top insights that you can get from this earnings report? Um, text generation is another category. A lot of these, um, you know, write me a poem or write me a story, maybe not super interesting uh, in the category of finance, um, but things like style transfer get at these basic capabilities. You can give a, a Wikipedia article as an example and say, okay, well, this is in a Wikipedia article format. Now I want it uh, as a timeline or now I want the entities and their relationship to each other in this text. And you might want that not as a gateway to asking more questions, but as a map of what the information is, as a way to synthesize and understand. Um, and finally, I, I wanna call out uh, code generation. Um, so the, after ChatGPT, the, the next most interesting LLM application, I think, is Copilot, which is an autocomplete uh, for programming available inside VS Code and other places. Um, and between Copilot, which does kind of autocomplete, and Toolformer, which is a way of generating executable commands in the span of, of generation at inference time, um, you, you start to bridge a gap between um, generating language and having some kind of effect on the world, some kind of action space. Um, and it starts, and when, when you start to squint your eyes, you can imagine a future where the way that we write software is fundamentally changed um, by these new capabilities. Okay, so let me, um, let me start to, to get into a little more of the technical meat. I'm gonna talk about transformer language models. I'm, I don't have time to go into um, enough, enough depth about these models, but I hope that you can get some um, like high-level insights on how these models work, uh, why they're interesting. So the, at the heart of all of the transformer models, um, you know, the, the GPT-3 model as well as BERT models um, are, is a transformer block. Um, and so the, the most important part about the transformer block is that the input dimension and the output dimension of the transformer block, uh, the dimensionality is the same. Um, and so if you have 7,000 dimensions coming in, you have 7,000 dimensions coming out. Um, and within the transformer block, there are two subcomponent pieces. Um, the, the first one is an attention mechanism that we'll spend some time on. Um, and the second one is a feed forward network that I'll cover much more quickly. Um, but um, I wanna emphasize that, that one of the interesting properties of the transformer block is that the, the input after each of these two subcomponents is added back into kind of this mainline representation that's being carried through. Um, and so as a consequence, you get a sort of regularization of that dimensionality as through each transformer block. And one of the properties that people have started to look at, explore experimentally, is to what degree the embedding spaces after each of these transformer blocks are different or the same. Because um, it could be totally different. In fact, because of the this effect of adding in the residuals um, after each of the, af during through the transformer block, they're actually very similar. Um, and so you can interpret um, the the embedding layer that comes after the first layer of the transformer block the same way that you interpret it at the end. It's kind of very interesting, surprising property for me uh, about the transformer um, networks in general. The other thing I want to call out. Um, not to spend a whole lot of time on, is um, in addition to the, uh, the add layer, where you add the residuals back into the mainline representation, there's also a normalization piece where you n normalize um, the activations that come out of the, the subcomponent block. Um, and I, and it's, I mentioned it because, um, you know, there's, there was a lot of time spent, people spent a lot of time thinking about what the right normalization to use in these models were, and the reason is because of numerical stability of the optimization. Uh, without doing, without thinking carefully about how you want to normalize, um, you know, the activations as, as they're propagated through, you got under, underflow or overflow of the gradients, and you got very unstable training. Um, and there are going to be a lot of things um, that I'm going to return to in the talk, which are not about the, the model itself, but about uh, how do you train this kind of a thing in a stable way. And the norm, this layer norm, um, is one example. But there are gonna be a bunch more. 
Um, okay, so to go into the meat of the model a little bit more, um, again, I, I said there, there are two subcomponents. The first is the attention layer. The second is the feed forward going, uh, I guess, from, from least complicated to more, mo to more complicated. The feed forward network is um, a very familiar two-layer dense perceptron network with a non-linear activation in the middle. Um, uh, maybe that's ReLU, maybe it's, it's uh, you know, SWE glue or something, uh, you know, fancy, but it's basically some nonlinear activation. Um, the attention layer, though, is uh, what's doing most of the work, or most of the, the novel new work um, in the transformer. And what the, the attention block does is it integrates representations uh, from previous words. And so, um, this example is a, a, a word sequence, the cow went. Um, this, if you recall, this was our original language modeling problem, uh, trying to predict the next word. Um, and the goal is after, if you're at the word went at that position in the model, um, you want to come up with a representation for that, for that word at that position. Um, and you want to integrate information from other positions, from previous words um, that you've seen. Okay, so. What the attention layer does um, is it uh, creates a probability distribution over all of the previous words. Um, and then according to that probability distribution, adds in the representation of those positions into the current representation. And so it kind of brings in information from other positions into the, into the model for went, into the representation for went. Um, and I guess what's, um, well, well, I'll call out here is if you look at, um, and, and you can look at in, in the paper, which goes into more detail, the number of parameters in each of these subcomponents, um, you'll see that, that actually the feed forward network has many, many order, orders of magnitude more parameters than the intention mechanism. Um, and so really what's, you can, you can almost imagine that what's happening is um, the attention mechanism is telling you what previous positions are important and the feed forward network is pulling information about that representation, enriching that representation, refining it um, as you go up. Um, so uh, to, to kind of make the point, the, the transformer network is a series of blocks uh, for any particular position. Um, there are a lot of, it's kind of like a column. There are many blocks in that column. Um, and they're different, you know, they're different uh, column, there's a column for each separate position in the input sequence. Um, so if you were gonna look at the unrolled um, model as you're doing inference, you would see at every position there's a column um, and then there are a number of rows and the rows correspond to transformer blocks. Um, and the, the attention mechanism is the place at which previous positions are integrated into the representation of your current, um, into your current position, your current word. Um, and as you go up, as, as you go up um, in each of the layers, um, those layers pull in representations again pr at previous positions at the same layer. So if you're in the third word, which is uh, went, I guess it's dropped off the bottom, um, at the first layer, at the first row, you're gonna look at the representations at the first row for cow and for the. Um, at the second row, you're gonna look at the representations from the second row of cow and the. Um, so there's also, um, you know, we presented, I presented the previous slide that attention is around um, pulling in other representations. Actually, they're, they're multi-heads. Um, and so there are multiple different attention mechanisms that happen in that attention block. It's not just one uh, attention mechanism. Um, so to get a trans, uh, decoder only transformer language model, um, there are two other pieces you need. One is you need to transform the input word sequence into an embedding space. Um, and then at your output, uh, at the last transformer block, you have to induce a probability over all the output words. Um, and so a transformer only, a decoder only transformer language model um, is a set of 
transformer blocks where the, the input is this embedding layer and the output is a uh, soft max over all the, the word tokens. Okay, so this is the, this is the, the basics, this is the mathematics of the transformer um, model. And this has been, I think it was 2017, 2018, um, the attention is all you need paper that came out of Google presented this basic model, um, and it's been more or less unchanged since then. Uh, however, um, there have been a lot of tweaks and experimentation inside of this basic architecture. One I, I mentioned briefly earlier, which is um, the exact activation function, so ReLU as opposed to SWE glue or GI glue. You know, there's some, again, stability reasons you might prefer a more continuous as opposed to a discontinuous activation function. Um, maybe you're great, you want your gradient to perform to be a little more smooth um, as, as you kind of, as you, as you go below the activation threshold. Um, another thing that people have experimented with is location of layer norms. As an example, an extra layer norm after the embedding layer. Um, and the purpose of all these layer norms, again, is a stability purpose, it's not a informational purpose. The final thing is um, a positional embedding uh, choice, which is, you know, to, for the model to know, be able to, to integrate information representations from previous words, um, you often add some information about what the position is, which is some kind of encoding that you add in. Uh, maybe it's a rotational encoding. Recently, Alibi, which is a linear, um, some kind of linear graded encoding um, is added in. But, but, but the, the contours of the transformer model um, haven't, haven't changed. These little pieces have changed. Um, okay, even with this overall model architecture set though, there are many, many choices. Um, and so in the next kind of set of slides, I'm gonna go through some of the choices that you have to make uh, after you've decided, okay, I'm gonna train a decoder owner only transformer language model, then you're faced with another set of decisions. So let me go through these decisions uh, kind of at a high level and then I'll explain um, how, we, how we made some of them and how we thought about them. So the first is the model shape and size. Uh, so you know, you're gonna have multiple transformer blocks. Uh, how many are you gonna have? What is the embedding dimension that you're gonna have? What's the, the, the inner dimension that you're gonna have between all of the blocks. Um, given a particular model size, what is the data set size? Uh, do you need what's optimal? Um, then there are a bunch of things which are around computational efficiency. So at a very low level, uh, how, how do you implement each of the operations, the attention mechanism, as an example, efficiently? And that happens at, uh, at the CUDA layer, um, which is you know, a very low level language for, for interacting with the GPU. Um, there are also questions about hardware. Um, what's the optimal hardware configuration? Um, the, the core, the, the biggest piece of engineering um, is the distributed optimizer. You have a big uh, uh, you know, gradient-based problem. How do you compute, um, how do you compute gradients um, and update your parameters? Um, the, the, the engineering of building that optimizer are very complicated. Um, then there are, uh, you know, many hyperparameters. Learning rate is one of them. Uh, numerical precision um, is another uh, another problem, which is which is, um, you know, kind of exciting for me because it gets at the link between the the mathematics um, and the the hardware details. You know, and so this is how are you representing each parameter? Are you representing it in full precision with four bytes? Are you representing it in half precision, half precision with two bytes? Um, people are looking at even representing, uh, you know, a parameter or gradient update with four bits uh, in in four. And the reason that you do all of this, you know, very fiddly little work is for increased performance um, because you're training these models for a long time. It's expensive. Finally, there there's some issues around the data set tokenization, data set composition. I'll go into those a little bit more. Um, so, as we, um, uh, as we went to go train our model, uh, the Bloomberg GPT model, um, you know, we had to address each of these questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna present 
um, some of the some of our thought process around some of the issues. And the first one is uh, the first one I'll talk about is um, model shape and data set size. Um, so GPT-3 um, was a 175 billion parameter model. Um, and so one of the big questions as we were starting to do this work is, well, do we need to go to that many parameters in order to get good performance? Um, and so there was a paper, a chinchilla paper out of Google um, that said, no, actually there's for a given compute budget, um, we posit a linear relationship between the size of the model, the maximum size of the model, and um, the amount of tokens that you want to train with. And we believe that any, you know, for, for any given um, compute budget, the optimal model size and data set size will lie on, on this linear, um, lie according to this linear um, model. Um, and so we chose a model, so, so we said, okay, well, what is our budget? What's our expected budget? Um, let's pick a point on that on that line. Um, and so we chose uh, a 50 billion parameter model with around, uh, I think, 600 billion tokens. Um, since the Chinchilla paper, there was a paper out of Facebook, the Lo this Llama paper, that actually did uh, seven Chinchilla tokens for a given model size uh, was their proposal. And I think after we had done our training, we looked at this paper and we were like, oh, okay, we probably should have trained longer. Um, the, and then one of the impacts on model size versus data is that um, uh, a bigger model computationally is just more expensive uh, to run an inference. And so if you have a smaller model that you train for longer, even if it's not the most efficient uh, uh, way to get to a, a level of performance, um, it might be a more cost efficient solution. And so you might choose to train spend more time upfront uh, in training um, in exchange for lower inference costs. Um, so uh, this was our, this, these were our model choices. We chose a uh, 7,000 dimension. These are the, the embedding dimensions um, and 70 transformer blocks. Um, there are actually a number of other parameters um, that are involved that you have to choose. These are the two biggest choices. Uh, the paper has all the details of kind of all of our parameter choices. Um, and we also chose a, a total data set size. Um, so these are the models that we compare against uh, in our next section. There's um, GPT-3, GPT-3 was kind of our, we say our springboard to action, so we compare against that. Um, NeoX, OPT-66, and Bloom are all open-ish models. OPT-66 isn't available for commercial purposes. Um, but we could uh, use it for research points of comparison. Neo X and Bloom uh, have very permissive licenses. Um, and so there, if we're looking at an open source solution, um, they're a reasonable point of comparison. And, and I guess what you can note right away is that there's a big, big variety in the amount of training data um, and the number of parameters. So if you look at Neo X as an example, it has 20 billion parameters. It's the smallest model here. Um, but aside from us, it has the largest total data size. Um, when I show you experimental results in a little bit, you'll see that NeoX actually is quite uh, good performing with, for its parameter size. The other thing that uh, we spent a while thinking about was our tokenizer. So usually in training these models, uh, people use the GPT-2 tokenizer. Um, and there are a few properties about the GPT tokenizer um, which we didn't feel were good fits. One is it doesn't, um, it doesn't treat numbers specially, and so it treats numbers as a whole, as a whole chunk, um, as like a, you can have a number token. Um, and, in, and if you're doing a lot of numeric processing, numeric understanding, it doesn't seem, it seems like something's a little bit off for that. Um, there's also, it didn't allow multi-word tokens. Um, so we trained our own tokenizer on the pile, and we are, and we chose um, actually quite a large vocabulary size based on uh, an optimal, what we, you know, some empirical optimal data compression characteristics. Um, we also, uh, you know, chose to use multi-word tokens, um, and I think this was a choice that um, if I had to do it over again, wouldn't do. Multi-word tokens allow you to compress a lot better, but at prompt time. Um, they have this weird property that if you give a prompt, 
as an example, that falls in the middle of a multi-word token, um, the model has never seen that context before and it doesn't really do well in completion. Um, so that's a, that was a choice um, that I think we probably have to revisit. Um, just a note on hardware. Um, so we used, uh, we ran on Amazon. Uh, we used 64 of their largest available at the time uh, instances. Um, each instance has this configuration. It's a, uh, it has, each node has eight A100 40 gigabyte GPUs. Um, and what's significant isn't, isn't just the, the model class, the Ampere, um, but it's also the memory of each GPU because you know, these models are, are really quite large and they take up a lot of memory. And so 40 gigabytes, as opposed to the larger configuration, 80 gigabytes, um, there's probably an impact on performance in that change. Um, there are also um, performance implications of the intranode and internode connections. You know, because you're doing this distributed optimization, um, a model doesn't fit on one GPU. You have to actually scale it across multiple GPUs just for one model. So in the computation of the gradient and in the stochastic optimization step, you have to do a lot of parameter passing back and forth and gradient passing back and forth. And so the, the intranode communication costs and the internode communication costs are actually considerable. Um, so in total, there were 512 GPUs, um, which was uh, 64 uh, instances of uh, A8, A100 GPUs. Um, and so we, re we reported in the paper, um, we observed um, 105 teraflops out of this configuration. The theoretical optimal for these uh, GPUs or the, the observed empirical optimal is 350 teraflops. Um, you know, this, this performance wasn't great. Uh, we've seen, so Bloom, um, as an example, reported uh, 175 teraflops on their proprietary, sorry, they didn't have a pr proprietary cluster. They had a dedicated cluster um, of, of A100 80s, I think. Um, in the, you know, it, as a rumor, I've heard, you know, into the 200 teraflops performance observed. And the reason that you care about this isn't the, the performance of the model. The reason that you care um, is, the, uh, is your compute budget. For a fixed compute budget, the more, te the more flops you can go through, the more data that you can train on, the bigger model you can train, the better performance. Um, okay, so um, on data set. So I would say the, the biggest choice that we made um, and kind of the, the biggest uh, surprise about the model is we chose to have roughly equal parts of public and private data. Um, so we collected a bunch of public data sources, uh, the Pile C4 Wikipedia, um, and then we added a bunch of data that had been curated through our business process. You know, Bloomberg is, um, you know, uh, uh, very much in a data collection, analytics, distribution um, uh, uh, company and, and product. And so we just, as part of our process, we collected a lot of data. A lot of that was web content. Um, but, you know, it goes back, you know, uh, many years. So we have in 2007, I think, was the earliest year that we included. And so, you know, part of the point was, yeah, if you had been around in 2007, you could have collected this data. Um, we did collect it, and where we were able to, we've kept hold of it. Um, similarly for, you know, SEC Edgar filings. It's public, you could collect it, uh, and we had it, and we had it readily available. Um, all in all, the, the amount of data across each of these, it was about 300 billion tokens in public data and 300 billion tokens in private data. Um, so I'm gonna briefly talk about kind of um, our training process. We released the, what, what people have started calling Chronicles, um, which go into detail about our training process. We released it, I wanna say, a week or two weeks ago. Um, but I, I wanna go through it at least quickly to give you a sense of, okay, well, even after you have the model architecture and you've chosen all of your larger choices, what happens actually during training? Um, and, you know, the setup is very different than a traditional machine learning setup because uh, you, we, we really couldn't run it more than once. We really had one shot. Um, if we got some of our tuning parameters wrong, uh, as we did, um, 
you know, we had very tough questions about, well, what is it, what would it actually cost for us to start from scratch again? Um, as opposed to, you know, if you were gonna do a hyperparameter sweep in a traditional machine learning kind of problem, kind of setup. Okay, so um, we started uh, at V0, uh, that was our, our first attempt, um, and we started training, and we observed that the training loss plateaued um, after about 10,000 steps, um, and there, there was no improvement to our, our dev loss. We had a separate dev evaluation step after about 200 um, steps. Um, and so we looked at the model, and one of the choices we had made, I didn't tell you about this, but one of the choices we had made at V0 is we decided to order our data chronologically um, as we put it into the model. And so then we, we had this problem where we realized, oh, because of our, our training curriculum and because of, uh, and our, our dev test was, um, you know, our held out dev test from a different time period, we, we couldn't distinguish two types of mistakes. One is maybe our model was wrong um, or, or some, somehow we had made a mistake um, or um, that there was just a difference between our evaluation and our training conditions. Um, that somehow the temporal curriculum ordering was throwing off our computation. And so we said, okay, well, enough of that. We're gonna start over. We're going to reshuffle everything, uh, not according to time. We're gonna get it uh, more clear about what our evaluation set looks like. Um, instead of using a held out news test set, we're gonna use a um, evenly sampled representative data set from all of our data sources um, so that we know at least our training distribution matches our evaluation distribution. Okay, well maybe we should have learned that, we should have thought about that at the beginning, um, but it was very important for us to come to that point and, and make that change. Um, so then we started our V1, um, and after about 12,000 steps, we observed that the gradient norm uh, was increasing. Um, it's the norm of the gradients. Um, and we also observed um, dev loss jumps, so the, the dev loss would spike. And so if you see in the bottom, um, that is the, the, the gradient, the overall gradient norm. The graph on the top is, uh, you know, we were kind of looking at this and we are like, well, is this, is this bad? Is this wrong? Should we be seeing this? Should we not be seeing this? Um, I think the graph at the top convinced us that something weird was happening. So this is a graph of the gradient norms um, per layer. So the, 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 sorry, per parameter group. So both per layer and per, um, like the, the, you know, the attention, uh, the, the gradients of the second layer of the feed forward network, just the total gradients there. Um, and so we, we observed that one of those gradient norms was just increasing. Um, and so that is, that was a weird behavior. And that particular gradient norm was the layer norm, um, the first layer norm. Um, and so we kind of looked at that and we're like, oh, something is, that looks fishy. That doesn't look what you'd expect. It looks like there's some, some something which is happening. Um, and so we did a lot of things to kind of fix it. We restarted, we went backwards, we restarted, we shuffled, we reduced the, the learning rate. Um, we decided to change the precision of the gradients in the um, language model head. So this is the, the soft max at the end. We had been doing this in half precision. We decided to change it to full precision. So we were like, well, that's an area that, that really is important to get right. Um, but eventually we came to the conclusion that this run was unsalvageable um, and we started again. Um, and at this point we made a whole host of changes. Um, you know, the, the change in precision in the language model head was one of them. Uh, we changed the seed, it was kind of like a desperate move. We added a layer norm after the embedding, the idea of improving stability. We had a longer learning rate warm up. Um, this one was significant, the, the layer norm um, was in our weight decay group. Weight decay is one of these, um, you know, regularization kinds of techniques that you do to improve stability. Layer norm was in our weight dec decay group. Um, that seemed like maybe a weird choice. Uh, so we took that out. We changed our initialization, many, many changes, and we restarted. Um, and you know, as uh, as as a scientist, this is very troubling uh, because you know we we can completed our work and we got to a model that that we're happy about. I'll tell you about that in a moment. But it was hard to say which of these changes actually led 
to performance? What is what was the parameter that mattered? Was it the the learning rate warm up? And so it's it, but at the at the cost, the computational cost of running each of these experiments, we couldn't afford to do it. Um, and so I think there's a lot of, um, you know, by, by sharing the chronicles and by sharing in a very detailed way the way that we did it, I think our hope is that, okay, this is a set of choices um, that uh, the field in general can start discussing and figuring out what is really important here and what isn't. Um, let me turn to evaluation. Um, so. Uh, there are a few different evaluations you want to run. Um, there's an evaluation as you're running it, which is the dev loss I've talked a little bit about. Um, then there's a post-training evaluation. Um, and then finally, there's a, uh, you know, the in-product evaluation. Um, and we're in the middle of that now. Um, so the, you know, the, the general domain, we, we looked at a few different evaluations. Um, there were two that I'm going to cover here. They're more in the paper that are general domain. The first is what's called Big Bench Hard, um, and it's a set of uh, especially challenging NLP tasks. Some are a little more NLP in nature, some are algorithmic in nature. Um, I just want to point you to um, the performance results. If you look at our performance, we're around where Bloom is, a little bit less. Palm, which is Google's uh, previous generation of model, is quite a bit better. Um, the massive multitask language understanding set of evaluations are subject matter evaluations. Um, so if you, if you can read the tiny little font, there's uh, you know, chemistry evaluations, biology, um, and really deep domains. Um, and so here, um, if you look at our performance against uh, the Bloom model, we edge that out slightly. Uh, we're a little bit behind GPT-3, but not considerably. Um, just a, a point on evaluation, you know, we evaluated against other large language models which were open source, um, GPT-3. We didn't evaluate, uh, we don't show in the paper evaluations against um, models after GPT-3. Everything after that is instruction tuned, uh, which is a whole other kind of post-training conditioning, um, which dramatically improves results. Um, Finally, kind of getting to the last area of valuation were in, in domain, in finance domain, public data sets. And so you can see here our model significantly outperforms the other models that we've looked at, um, in some cases by a few points, in, in some cases by 10 points. Um, on average, I think it's eight points over Bloom. Uh, finally, we also evaluated on our, these previously, previous slide was on publicly available financial Evaluations. These are our internal financial evaluations for tasks that we do. Um, and so on that, we saw even bigger gains. Um, in, in NER, just to call one thing out, in NER, which is just what companies are mentioned, um, Bloom has a slight edge, but when it's ticker extraction, uh, which is what we really need, uh, we have significantly improved performance. Um, so on ticker extraction, which is NER and NED, uh, we're about 20 points over Bloom, um, and I think another eight points over six, six points over OPT66. Um, and so these experiments for us were a demonstration that even at these very large training data regimes, 300 billion tokens, 600 billion tokens, in-domain data makes a big difference. Uh, okay, so now uh, a quick discussion. I wanna talk about two tasks that we're looking at now. One is uh, text to BQL. BQL is our data query language. It's a very deep, complex language. Um, most people only use the tip of the iceberg. Um, one of the things that we're exploring is how to make people um, get into BQL faster. Um, the other kind of category of thing that we're, we're thinking a lot about is how to make the terminal um, more of a language interface. So if you see on the far left, um, this is something that we do today. If you type in market cap of Apple versus Microsoft on the two line or on the command line, you get a graph and it'll give you the market cap of Apple and, Mi and Microsoft for the past year. Okay, but, but what if you want that for the past 10 years? Okay, well, you have to find the amber box which, and change that date range. Um, and maybe the trade-off between typing in start from 2010 and going to the amber box, maybe it's a even, even odds which is better. But when you start to get to some deep um, change on that graph, like add the number of employees 
to this graph, um, then it actually really is a pain to do through the GUI. And it's not a failure of the GUI, it's a failure of GUIs. You know, there's only so much real estate, there are only so many choices you can present to a user. At a certain point, you really want an open-ended, flexible language interface. Um, this is an area that we've been building. It's been very expensive, hard for us to build. Uh, we think we can do a lot with language models. Um, okay, so, so key takeaways, and then I'll have one more slide. Um, so I think the point for us is that even though model stability and efficiency are challenging, it's possible for a relatively small team uh, to build a LLM around the same quality as GPT-3. Um, and then the second uh, takeaway is that um, training on in-domain data, even at the data set sizes of hundreds of billions of tokens, yields stronger in-domain performance uh, while retaining performance in general tasks. Um, and then three open questions. Um, you know, we, one of the questions is, is how is efficient uh, is the training, and uh, there's probably a lot of ways that we can improve the sample efficiency, the memorization of the model for particular data sets. Um, there's kind of a larger empirical question that, that it'd be nice to answer, which is, you know, we did this joint pre-training across, uh, you know, in general, uh, general domain knowledge and finance. Well, what would, would have been the impact if we had trained general first and then did finance, as opposed to mixing them together? Would love to run that experiment. Um, don't know what the outcome would be. I suspect it'd be a little bit worse, but maybe not. Maybe it'd be a lot worse. Maybe it'd be better. Don't know. Um, and then finally, um, on post-training conditioning, um, you know, the Instruct GPT and all of the, what they call the um, re re reinforcement learning for human feedback, RLHF, work takes a base language model and adapts it slightly, it conditions it. Um, the best way to do that, the most efficient way to do that, how to do that on these, on these uh, large models um, is a big area that, that we're interested in and think is very important for getting good performance out of models. Uh, so in summary, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciated getting to present this work. We have time for questions. Uh, it's a great talk and many of the insights. Thank you for the sharing. And I uh, uh, have two questions. The first question is, uh, since you are doing this actually, the training is right before the 3.5 and, and GPT 3.5 and GPT 4. And uh, if you're doing now, I mean, given they have Llama or all other kind of the, you mentioned about the, those the post uh, conditioning on the same, what would you do differently, I mean, right now? Well, Llama's tricky because Llama doesn't have a commercial license, so we can't really use Llama. Um, but there are a bunch of open source models which are, which are super interesting. So like the Mosaic has a model, Together has a model, um, which are 7B models, and they're very good. Um, there's still not, a, there's not a 20 billion, 50 billion model size that's open that is really high performant. So I don't know, if I had to make a choice again today, um, I think I might, I might have done, I might do the same thing. Um, but in six months, a year, there might be very different models available. Uh, so we're, we're watching that very carefully. And the second question is, uh, in the finance, we care a lot of the point in time. And you mentioned in the second, the, in the V1 model, you do the reshuffle the data and getting a better performance. And I just wonder, uh, what do you comment on the, if we do the model always at a point in time, and uh, what would be the difference? And, and uh, did you do a, a kind of the performance actually evaluation or style kind of shifted on the NRP part and, and, and actually the effect of the, the point in time? Uh, we haven't done that experiment. I would love to. I think it's a, you know, in, in, in finance, it is a big deal. Exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, and then you also want to be able to ask questions like, well, in 2010, what did people think was interesting? Um, and you want some kind of guarantees that you don't get contamination or don't get any of the, um, you know, the, the, you know, this, you know, mixed bad back test kind of things. Um, uh, I don't know, I don't know the right way to do that. Like, and, you know, one of the questions would be, is there a way to store multiple point and model 
multiple point in time models efficiently or to train them efficiently as opposed to having the whole model um, or to be able to retrieve you know, from 2011 a particular you know, fact from then um, accurately. Uh, I don't know the best way to do that. There are a bunch of proposals. Nothing seems great. Yeah, thanks for the talk and like the training chronicles. It's very useful to know that. Um, you know, I have like two questions. Uh, the first one is, I think you mentioned a little bit in your open questions about like fine tuning, but like what do you also think about like, you know, not full fine tuning, but f parameter efficient fine tuning like LoRa on like, you know, um, instruction tuned models which are kind of, you know, a little bit ahead still of this rather than like building your own from scratch. Like I, I guess my question is more about, uh, do you think how much is the utility of like building your own in-domain model from scratch versus like taking some of these more faster evolving ones and like, you know, um, tuning that more uh, computationally efficiently. Uh, well, well, Laura and all the, the parameter efficient fine tuning stuff is awesome. Um, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot to be gained. Um, you know, I think the, you know, for, you know, for the reasons I just discussed, there, there wasn't a great open source model at the time that we did this work um, to build off of, I, I expect that's going to change. And as that changes, you know, I think we'll be very curious about fine tuning. You could also imagine um, like other more aggressive ways of putting new knowledge into models. There was this line of work um, on memorizing, memorizing transformers where you have some out of band memory um, that you then integrate into a model. Um, that would be another way of doing it. It's all very, I think very, very, very interesting. So I don't, I don't, I don't think I have an opinion, um, uh, uh, but it's 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 certainly of interest. Yeah. And and then the second question is more in general about the space of LLMs and like very large scale data training. Like, so what did you do exactly to make you know ensure that there is not you don't having like data leakage when you're doing you know the evaluations? Well. Um, that's a hard one. So the so when we did our dev loss evaluation, we had um, you know initially we had held up news data, um, and so in in you know in a temporal news stream, you can say okay, well this is I know that you've never seen what happened in July because I've only given you up to June. Um, you don't have any of those kinds of guarantees for in in almost any other domain, and so I don't know. Um, you know, for, for things like MMLU as an example, like to what degree is the input data contaminated with, um, you know, with training data? One of, I don't remember which model, but one of the models, not, not our model, a different model had some um, examples um, on a blog post of these are the things that the model can generate. And I remember going through and finding all of those examples on the open web. And I couldn't, you know, I don't know, well, okay, was that, was that leakage? Did they just pull it from? Or did they, um, after this came out, maybe someone took, took the output and put it onto the web? Um, but I think there's, uh, you know, it's, it's a big, there's a big open question mark about data leakage and, and how, to what degree are, you know, are the models so successful in some of, the, some of these tests just because they've seen, they've seen all of the answers, which is good, but it's, but it's, uh, you know, it's different than reasoning over novel kinds of situations. Thank you so much. Two more questions. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have two questions about the implementation. The first one is which optimizer did you use? I know you mentioned weight decay for layer norms, so is it like AMW? And the second question is, how did you go about um, scaling the variance of uh, the parameters at initialization to avoid exploding gradients? Uh, so we used, we did use NMW, but that's only, you know, um, that's, that's the optimizer, but you also have to think about the, how you're actually doing the distributed optimization procedure. And so we used the SageMaker SMP distributed optimizer, which has a three-way uh, uh, parallelism. It has like a data parallelism, a model parallelism, a tensor parallelism in order to get things uh, efficient. It doesn't change the computation, but it, but it makes things more efficient. Um, uh, I don't. I don't remember how we addressed uh, the variance uh, issue in the in the initialization. Uh, I'd have to go back and check. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My uh, question is, 
in a lot of talk around LLMs, there's a huge question of, of accuracy and whether or not the model can reliably, or future models could reliably detect uh, or give a weighting on, on how certain it is that uh, its, its output is reasonable uh, or if it might be totally fictitious. I was wondering, particularly for um, building domain-specific LLMs, if you or your team have started having thoughts about how you incorporate um, measures that sort of put a, a benchmark or a safeguard against uh, potentially uh, considerably in, inaccurate responses. Yeah, well, look, we're really, we're, we're very concerned about it very, and thinking about it very thoughtfully. I guess the, um, the biggest thing is most of the application areas that we're looking at are applications areas where you're generating into something which is a structured form. So the two ones I showed you, BQL, um, as an example, um, you know, it's hard to write a defamatory or a derogatory BQL query. I'm sure it's possible, but uh, it's very big language, but, uh, but, it's, but it's hard to do that. And so that kind of like decreases our area of concern. Similarly for the charts uh, example, you know, yeah, okay, maybe we've misinterpreted, but it, there's, there are probably remedies that we can do on the output side to check. I think we're, we're thinking very carefully about how we do some of the more generative use cases uh, safely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank everyone for coming. This concludes our program. Uh, I think this was a very successful event uh, in general. Thank you all for uh, contributing. As I said in the beginning, uh, we are going to start preparation for the 10th annual event shortly. So if you have work in mind that you think would be fit, please let us know. And we will have a cocktail reception right outside on your left uh, immediately after. So. Just looking forward to seeing you in the 10th annual in 2024. <laughs>